Welcome to a series of videos on axial members. That would be members that are either loaded in tension, parallel to the axis of the member, or loaded in compression along the axis of the member, in which case we will either refer to them as columns or compression struts. We're going to begin by looking at tension members, and in particular we're going to focus on failure modes. Among the general comments are that tension members were addressed extensively in videos related to the design process in Chapter 1. Some of that material is repeated here to provide context. However, the primary focus of this video is on the failure modes for tension members, which are failure of the connections or yielding of the tensile material. The learning objectives for this particular video are to understand how tension members fail and the design implications of those failure modes when incorporating tension members in architectural structures. As we mentioned, the two failure modes for tension members are either failure of the connections, which is often a very challenging part of the problem, or yielding of the material in the tensile member. The common materials for tension members in architecture are, are steel, uh, aluminum, stainless steel, and I should have also mentioned here high strength steel, which we will address in our discussions later on. High strength steel cable is a fairly uh, common and important uh, building material. In steel, the resistance factor phi for a tension member uh, was set at 0 0.85 for the manual of steel construction that prevailed at the time that the textbook was written. So in other words, the design stress to which we have to design is 0 0.85 times the yield stress of the material. This 0.85, I remind you, is the so-called resistance factor, which um, has built into it a 15% safety factor, which accounts for our uncertainty in the behavior of the member. This was a pretty conservative number at its time. It has been hotly debated, and in more recent versions of the Manual of Steel Construction, this number has been put at 0.90. However, to avoid confusion, we're going to remain consistent with the book, with the textbook, and with the previous versions of the steel manual, with the understanding that it's fine for us to do that because this 0.85 factor is on the conservative side. For the purposes of this course, we're also going to take the phi factor for aluminum and stainless steel to be 0.85. So for every one of these materials, we will multiply whatever the yield stress is by 0 0.85 in order to come up with our design stress. So, as examples of tensile elements in architecture, a classic one is steel, rebar, and concrete. We know that concrete performs very poorly uh, in tension. Its tensile strength is on the order of one-tenth of its compressive strength. So anytime we have any significant tensile forces that are going to be occurring in a concrete element, that concrete element has got to be uh, reinforced with steel and the steel becomes responsible for all the tensile forces. Even in members that we don't expect to have any significant tensile forces, we will still reinforce concrete uh, to take care of what we call shrinkage cracks. In this particular uh, application, we see some formwork, which is going to get filled up to this level right here with concrete. You'll notice spanning across the center here are some two by fours that are supporting a plate, and through that plate are anchor bolts. Those anchor bolts are going to be embedded in the concrete. The plywood plate is there as a, a spacer indicator to make sure that the uh, anchor bolts are where they're supposed to be. Uh, once the concrete is poured and, and has hardened, this um, 
spacer element, this piece of plywood, will be removed and then the base plate of the column will be lowered over these anchor bolts and bolted in place. You'll notice down at the bottom we have a mat of steel rebar running in both directions. Um, the fact that there's only steel in the bottom tells us there will be no uplift on this column. So somehow we're pretty much assured by the nature of the role of this column within the context of the overall structure that there will be no uplift, there will only be a downward or gravity force which will be inducing tension in this steel mat at the base of the footing. Now we talked about connections being crucial. Uh, one of the things that's absolutely crucial is that we know that we have enough embedment of the rebar in the concrete that it will not pull loose. In other words, we cannot develop the full strength of the rebar if we don't have a sufficient length of embedment in the concrete. In addition to that, though, we don't just rely on the concrete gluing itself to the steel rebar, which it will do, by the way, very well if anyone's ever done construction work and has had the experience of having concrete harden on the bare steel surfaces of a wheelbarrow you know it's a bear to get that concrete off of the steel. So there is good bonding of concrete to steel, but we don't rely on that. We create this embossed or knurled pattern on the steel rebar, the purpose of which is to make sure that rebar does not pull loose from the concrete, because if it does, then it does not do its role of providing the tensile reinforcement. So this is an example of the importance of the connection, in this case the connection between the concrete and the steel, which is going to allow the steel to be activated and to actually serve its function in tension. Um, we're not going to go into the details of, of how much embedment you have to have, but uh, needless to say, in a typical application it will be crucial for economic reasons that the design be uh, of such a nature that there's sufficient embedment that we know that that steel is not going to pull loose. Here's another example of a tension member. Uh, this is the California Academy of Sciences. It has this huge overhang on these super skinny columns and uh, there's no snow load in San Francisco but there is the load of uh, glass up above in the form of gravity load and the mass of that glass and the mass of the material in this overhang uh, causes um, some concerns in terms of uh, seismic effects of lateral movements of the building. So, and there are also wind load effects on these overhangs. So you'll notice cross bracing here these are rods which might be made out of aluminum or stainless steel. They could also be made out of some kind of plated uh, steel wire, but in this case they are solid rods of tensile material. Um, here's another example inside of the, the Academy of Sciences. This dome is stabilized. You'll notice there's a steel tube frame and that frame is stabilized with cross bracing. Here's another example that we talked about previously. Here this building is resisting forces parallel to these rigid frames through the moment action of, of these joints, but relative to force perpendicular to the planes of the rigid frames, the source of stability is this cross bracing. And you'll notice, by the way, that tensile elements in steel are so incredibly efficient that these rods are unbelievably slender. This is the detail at the base. The rods are threaded in a way that allows them to uh, be used to bring the building to perfect uh, plumb, but also to counter tension the structure so that we don't get rattling under uh, shifting forces due to changing in the directions of the wind loads, for example. We talked last time about the fact that if you start with a simple rod and you thread it, the threads cut away the rod. 
So uh, sometimes that's the cheapest and quickest thing to do is you just buy a rod that's oversized, you cut the threads at the end, and the size you bought the original rod to is governed by how deep the threads cut and how much material is left at the ends of the rod. If we want to be more economic and efficient and we also want to reduce any visual effects due to the diameter of the rod, we can do something like this where this particular rod was created by forging the ends uh, in a sort of a hammer type effect where the, the rod is grasped in a tight uh, grip and then heated up and hammered on the end to make it fatter at the ends and then it's threaded and the whole design is predicated on the assumption that these threads better leave more residual material at the ends than we have in the middle and then we know that the failure is going to occur in the middle. This happens to be a sample actually that was designed for testing in a machine, but this is more like what you will receive at the field. Uh, and it's a little harder to see here, but in, this, in the case of these rods, they actually are fatter near the ends where the threads occur as a way of making them more efficient. Again, we're not going to get, for the purposes of this course, we're not going to get into the details of the sizing of these threads uh, or what the diameter of the ends of these rods ought to be. Uh, it's a fairly routine thing that once we've sized the overall diameter of the rod to handle the load, uh, in specifying the rods you want, you indicate to the manufacturer what the overall length is, what the length of the threaded portion should be, and you say you want those threads designed in a way where they develop the full strength of the remainder of the rod. In other words, whatever these threads are, that portion should work as well as the remainder of the rod. Okay, so here we have a, a building with a huge arch that's spanning a city block and it's supporting the weight of 10 floors of building. So there's an outward thrust associated with this arch. There's a tension member holding it together, which is basically a bar, a flat slab of steel. And then it has a pin at the end. Now, in order for that pin to work, we have to drill a hole in the bar. When we drill that hole, we're removing material. So the weak spot would be where we drilled the hole because we remove material, but there'll also be some stress concentration occurring around that hole. So we would pretty drastically weaken the bar if we just bought a bar and drilled a hole in it. Um, sometimes it's in, a, in an application where you don't want to expend a lot of money, it's cheaper to buy a bar and oversize the bar to account for the effects of the, of the diminished strength associated with the drilled hole in it. In the case of this building, to keep this bar minimum, they decided to use this so-called I-bar configuration where it gets wider where the hole occurs and this whole thing was designed so there's enough material there that even after the hole is drilled and the pin is inserted, this portion of the structure will not be what will fail. It will occur somewhere back along the length here. Uh, here's another example of I-bars and I bars were popular for many decades in the construction of bridges and they are still used on occasions. Now we mentioned another kind of high strength uh, kind of steel which is high strength steel cable. Here we have a bridge where the cable comes over a support and comes down and attaches to the end of this turnbuckle and the turnbuckle is used to make adjustments uh, to lift up or uh, adjust the tension in the steel. In this case the steel cable has been a run, run around this eye and then back on itself and you'll notice that there's a very long length for developing strength here and the way the joint has been created is clamps have been used to clamp the incoming part of the cable to the returning part of the cable. Cable cannot be drilled it's too hard and it cannot be and it's also brittle so it would have stress concentrations associated with that drilling and it cannot be welded because the welding process diminishes its strength so 
One of the common ways that we use high strength steel cable and connect it is through friction connections. And literally, it's the friction between this incoming cable and the return cable that is uh, creating this joint. And this joint has some stress concentration associated with the bending of the cable and associated with these clamps. But amazingly enough, we can come very close to developing the full strength of this steel cable in this rather primitive looking connection. You'll notice the ends of the cable are just kind of frayed and ragged. And this would not be what you would regard as an elegant connector. Uh, but for a sort of cheap bridge like this in a outdoor application. Um, clearly this is a cheap and dirty, get the job done kind of solution that works pretty well. Carrying on with that theme of friction connectors, here's a suspender that comes up, gets looped over the top of the suspension cable and goes back down again. So it's hard to come up with a better connector than this because we never broke this strand. We didn't stop it there and make a connection we just looped it over and ran it continuously back. And that's one of the most elegant ways to make a connection. In this case, it would tend to slide down this suspender. And so there's a, a kind of um, shaped piece of forged metal that wraps around the suspend, suspension element. And using a bolt, it's then clamped around it. And it's the friction between that clamping mechanism and the suspension cable that keeps the suspender from sliding down the suspension cable. So that's an example relative to the movement, the lateral movement of a friction connector. And then this continuity of the suspender material is an example of an alternative kind of connection occurring at that same joint. We use exactly that same system even on huge bridges like the Golden Gate. So here we have some suspenders coming up, looping over the primary suspension. And this, by the way, is roughly one meter in diameter, densely packed with steel wire. Uh, it's encased to help protect it from the salt air. But again, we have this sort of clamping mechanism that goes around the primary suspension element and a whole series of bolts here that have been tightly clamped around it to prevent this suspender from sliding down the suspension element. So this is a, an example of a friction connector. Now, if we look at the overall Golden Gate Bridge, we discover that, or if we look at it historically, we discover that there are almost no real connections here. Huge spools of wire were used and a loop was drawn out over the tops of the towers and down through here and over the next tower and back to the anchorage on the other side. And when I say a loop, I mean it's basically the ingoing outgoing strand of a single wire that is drawn across here and looped over an eye bolt at this end so that literally miles of continuous strand of wire are run back and forth without any break and out without any connection occurring. So they're like this in the sense of here's a cable that doesn't stop here. It loops over and goes back, except in the case of these great cables here, they were drawn across a, a loop of wire at a time. And those loops, by the way, were drawn over this kind of saddle at the top. And this uh, shows the shape of that saddle, which contains that cable in a very gentle way. It cradles it and avoids any kind of stress concentration. This, by the way, these cables or loops were drawn into this thing right here. This is a gigantic chunk of concrete that's buried deep down into this mountain and that's what resists the force. This strand of uh, suspension material or these, these two huge cables look minuscule in the structure, but they required all of this concrete buried in the mountainside to resist the uh, outward pull of those cables. This shows some mild steel bars um, and the embedded concrete down in the foundation.
Um, these loops of wire were drawn across the bridge and hooked around these um, eyes or round portions here. And uh, right now you see these portions are bare to provide space for these people to work, but eventually more concrete got poured in to provide additional dead weight and further anchor those eye bars around which the strands of wire. So here we have many strands of wire coming in. The cable has been broken up and dispersed and had to be because it's going to this giant chunk of concrete and the concrete is inherently much weaker. So some way of distributing the force in those high strength steel wires had to be invented and basically the wires were splayed out uh, to distribute the force through that concrete anchorage. Now, sometimes we just go ahead and break a cable and, and we have to create a connector. And so this is an example here. We have seven strands or seven, excuse me, wires into a, a cable, um, spun into a cable. And inside of this piece right here is a tapered cone. And then we have uh, wedges that we call chucks which get jammed in between the inner surface, conical surface of this element and the cable. And in fact, these wedges um, have the shape of the strands and they sort of mold themselves to the strands to distribute the stress. So these strands were held with exactly that kind of chuck in a hydraulic device. They were pulled back into, in order to pre-tension them then more chuck elements got jammed into this conical volume. And um, on the other side of this giant steel plate is the concrete double T mold. And the concrete will get poured and hardened. And then these elements can be removed once the concrete has bonded itself sufficiently to hold this steel strand. This technology uh, is typically used in pre-stressed or post-tensioned uh, concrete elements such as hollow core planks or concrete double T's or post-tensioned slab floors. Every once in a while it gets used in some more exotic application. So for example, in the case of this building, which is the Federal Reserve Bank building in Minneapolis, there's a tension element that supports this structure which spans about 300 feet, by the way. And that tension element has some steel cables. It also has a 36 inch wide flange section, which is functioning as a tension member, not as a beam, but as a tension member. And that may seem odd to think of a 36 inch wide flange steel element as a tension member, but keep in mind, uh, this is roughly a 300 foot span. The length of this tension element is four or 500 feet. Um, a three foot deep element is not beam like when it's spanning four or 500 feet. It's more like spaghetti. And so you can think of that beam as that section, not as a beam, but as a tension member. So uh, this shows a cutaway with the trusses spanning from one side to the other. Here we have the tensile element with compression columns above, tension elements down below. So here we have compression elements carrying the load to this uh, tension element. And then each of these elements is supporting the floors by hanging off of that tension element. Um, this is a diagram that shows the steel cables and the 36 inch wide flange tension element that I mentioned. Um, the concept here is that steel cable stretches a lot under load and won't be stiff enough to keep the floors from moving around too much. If the floors move too much, the windows will rack and they'll crack and fall out. So the steel cable cannot be used to handle the live load, but it can be used to handle the dead load. Um, so in the design of this building, when a concrete floor would get poured uh, 
the tensile element would stretch and then the steel cables would be post-tensioned to pull it back up to plumb. Um, so these are those steel cables and this is the hydraulic device uh, one on each side of the building that was used to post-tension those cables. So every time a concrete floor got cast they would come and do this hydraulic operation to basically readjust the building. So when the building was finally built, all of the dead load was supported on these post-tension steel cables and the steel eye section, which is also working in tension, was basically neutral, but its presence there was to add additional bulk and stiffness to resist movement under the live load, which comes and goes over time. So that talks about friction connection connections. There's one other kind that we'd like to talk about. Uh, here we have high strength steel cable in the uh, trusses in the RDU airport. The cable comes in internal to this forged or cast fitting. Uh, and this would be cast steel, which is potentially has very high strength if it's done correctly. There's a tapered volume. The strands of this wire get separated out and splayed outward within that triangle, that uh, um, conical volume. And then the conical volume gets filled with a metal, which we call a brazing material. Um, that metal should have the characteristic that it's as strong as possible but as limited by the fact that its melting point has to be lower than the temperature that would cause the steel wire to detemper. Um, and so uh, classic examples of brazing material are brass or bronze or things of that sort. And I'm not sure exactly what was used here, but basically that metal becomes the glue that grabs the ends of those strands. This element, by the way, is called a clevis, and it's a classic technique that we use to terminate a cable and provide an interface between that cable and some weaker material like this steel plate. This may be very strong steel plate. It might even be uh, 80 kip per square inch or even 100 kip per square inch steel plate, but it's still relatively weak compared to the 250 KSI strength of the steel cable. So we need an element like this that becomes the mediator between the cable and that plate. By the way, you'll notice this really large uh, rod here uh, or pin and that has to be that large because of the weakness of this plate in bearing where that rod goes through the plate. Here's another example where that same technique was used. Uh, these are lenticular cable trusses in the um, Civic Center in, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, maybe it's Newport News, I can't remember. This was designed by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. Again, we have the cables coming into this tapered volume, which gets filled with this brazing material. And then you'll notice there are additional adjustments here in the form of threaded rods that allow these cables to be tensioned. The cables don't come exactly straight and it takes a fair amount of force to even get them straight so that you have them tensioned to the point that they're really doing their jobs. And so it's very, very common to see turnbuckles or some kind of adjustment at the ends of a structure like this. Closer to home, uh, in this case, the counter tensioning, by the way, is really apparent. Here we have a cable and another cable, and those two cables are working through these compression members to counter tension each other. The behavior of this is fairly apparent. Dorton Arena, on the other hand, is a little more subtle because you don't see two tension cables in the same plane counter tensioning each other. Instead, you have a series of gravity cables which hold the roof up, and a series of wind cables, which hold the roof down, and those table, cables should be counter-tensioning each other 
to keep the roof from fluttering and moving around. And when we get to chapter nine on tensile structures, we'll talk about some of the subtleties uh, and oddities of Dorton Arena, which is a really fascinating and puzzling building in many ways, but an unbelievably beautiful building. At any rate, uh, these cables are counter-tensioned against each other. And uh, this is what the building looks like. And these are the counter-tensioning techniques. The cables that are not very heavily stressed just have these kind of classic turnbuckles. The really major cables have these U-bolts. So here we have a U-bolt. And this is anchored deep into the concrete of the rib. And you'll notice there are two giant nuts here, and I don't even know what size they are, but probably five inches in diameter or something on that order. The steel cable in this case is entering here, and it goes into the tapered volume. And that tapered volume, uh, first the cable ends have been splayed outward, and then that tapered volume has been filled with brazing metal to achieve the connection between the cable and uh, this giant chunk of steel, basically. We can do the same kind of thing in the case of Dorton Arena. We said, well, there are draped cables in one direction and looped cables in the other, and they are counter-tensioning each other. This looks a whole lot like a fabric where we have a warp and a weft that are roughly at 90 degrees to each other, and they can be configured to counter-tension each other in a structure like this. Um, in this particular structure, when you go look at uh, chapter 9, you'll see all around the boundary of this fabric, where we have warp going in one direction and weft in the other, and creating a kind of everywhere sort of local saddle surface. When you get to the boundary of this, you'll discover that there are heavy metal plates that are shaped to the boundary and they support the edge of that fabric. So they clamp the fabric and glue the fabric all around the boundary, and then connections can be made through holes in those heavy metal plates. Grommets will not work. Um, a lot of times people will talk about how grommets are so great because when you put a hole through fabric, they help to keep the fabric from tearing if you run a cord or some kind of tension element through that hole. There's no doubt a grommet is better than just naked fabric being torn by the cord, but grommets do not begin to develop the full strength of the fabric. So if you really want to utilize the full strength of this fabric, you need to clamp it and glue it all the way around the boundary and leave no portion of the fabric untensioned. That's absolutely crucial to developing the full strength of the fabric at the connection point at the boundary. That ends our discussion of tension member failure modes from chapter five, section one.